us in a, a bit of shared reflection on this powerful film. I feel very grateful to Red River Theatre for creating this opportunity for us to experience this together. Um, once again, I'm Maggie Fogarty with the American Friends Service Committee. I want to uh, introduce two special guests, Jim Cates and his daughter Paula. So I want to invite you to come up if you could. what it would be like to have our own talk show, I think. <laughs> um, we, uh, 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 Arnie Alpert and I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to invite Jim to be with us to, sh to, ref to lead our reflection on this film because of his own deep commitments to civil rights and social justice and peace and how those commitments uh, get expressed through his capacity as an artist and as a, as a gifted publisher and poet and uh, educator. So, and then Jim had a wonderful offering of inviting his daughter Paula uh, so that we could include in this conversation the, the perspective of a younger generation. Um, so we thank you both for being with us. What I see my role as is quite minimalist. I want to create an opportunity for Jim and Paula to share and then as our time allows uh, to give you a chance to share your own connection to this powerful story because I know uh, because I know some of you I know that you have those uh, meaningful connections in your own lives so Jim why don't you... well first of all I think it was it was already your idea to have a member of the younger generation come. oh okay yeah. good <laughs> yeah, I can't claim credit for that I just I just as the conversation went on mentioned that one of the interesting intergenerational bonds with my daughter that I sort of in some ways would not have expected you know, was that she at, well, I guess when you were in junior high school, middle school, in, in middle school you started falling in love with Phil Oak songs, and walking around, <laughs> well, younger, walking around, walking around the school singing Draft Dodger Rag. <laughs> 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 um, um, and, 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 you know, this, this to me, um, you know, more than sort of, getting pompous about anything else. This to me is sort of the interesting ability of that I watched of Oaks, that Oaks seemed to have to reach out beyond my connect. I mean, my connection starts in the early 60s, hanging out in Greenwich Village, wandering around drinking underage, um, uh, going from cafe to cafe, and these people were not people I knew. You know, you didn't go and say, we know this is for folks, it's just someone you heard or you passed by. Um, and then, of course, the political connections and the way that Oaks gave a political voice with a lot of reservations. I mean, he was an establishment white boy, as the whole folk music scene was largely white. There were only probably very segregated scene, we should remember. Probably only two non-white people who were known in that world in that scene. So Denna and Len Chandler. Um, uh, and, um, but to have that sort of immediacy, which meant something to me, and which did come to an incredibly memorable thing with his suicide and with the Felt Forum concert that you heard at the end here, which I listened to on the radio, um, and to suddenly have Paula come up with a whole new different perspective on Oaks, um, a new generation of hearing the songs in a different way. So now I just want to wonder if you want to say something about the way you hear some of those songs. Um, oh, I guess there are like three ways that sort of break down the way I hear them. And the first is just the, the familial connection. Because like I listened to it with my dad and it was sort of a connection to his, his thing youth or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and just, you know, like I remember the first time I went away to camp, I listened to Phil Oaks because to me it was like when I was homesick because it made me think of my family and it made me think of home. And um, so that was always like that con that concept of it, like the connection with him. And then the second way it sort of affected me was as I got older, I'm a bit of a history buff, and this is now history. And Phil Oaks is in my history textbook this year, which is oh, wow. um, so just like that, and like the way it can, all the songs are so like historically relevant now, and listening to them and learning the history behind them, and him lecturing me on the history behind them, whether I wanted it or not. <laughs> um, and just sort of like that, because I just loved how it reflected the culture of the time. 
And I guess the third way it sort of was important to me was that it's just good music, and mm -hmm. I liked good music. Mm -hmm. I still do. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's sort of like the importance it always had for me was that connection in a sense. Um, I'm always easier rather than pontificating with conversation. So um, if people have conversation over and want to throw us at each other. Um, yeah. Um, I knew all of Phil Oak's music. I loved it. And I knew he was special and I knew he was different. And I knew he identified himself as a protest singer, not a folk singer. Yeah. And he died young. And that was all I knew. So all I, so I've learned a lot that I didn't know. But I know something that maybe some of you don't know. In around 1983 or 4, Country Joe McDonald, one, two, three, what are we fighting for? He made a rare trip east and played some small clubs. And I interviewed him. And um, he said that there was a kind of a mini blacklist that did not extend to every singer who performed at a peace rally. But he and Phil Oaks, who were known primarily as protest singers, jobs like opening shows for the Jefferson Airplane that he used to get suddenly stopped right. coming. Like the Dixie Chicks nowadays. Yeah. Uh -huh. As I think, you know. Well, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, one of the things, the first thing I thought of when I heard um, that he killed himself, one of the first things I'd flash back to was one of the last times that I, last time I, well, it was the last time that I heard him live, and that was at the People's Bicentennial in Concord, Massachusetts. You know, the other place where yeah. the first shot was fired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> not here. Uh, um, and you know, they, they, they mistakenly think and they celebrate the Bicentennial. Um, at the People's Bicentennial, and it was, we were on the hillside of Bartlett Far Farm, I don't know if you've been there, you've probably been there, you know that, everyone was, and it was twilight, and it was dark, it was spread out, you couldn't see anything, and all of a sudden, this voice emerged from where the performers were, singing Power and the Glory, which to me, I think should be the national anthem of this country, and the entire hillside, which had sort of been filled with sort of countercultural talk this and that, went absolutely dead silent. I mean, it went as if you were listening to grand opera. Silent. Reverent silence. And finally, the kid who was sitting on the blanket in front of me, a young man, whiz turned around and whispered to me, who is that? And that's sort of what I kept as a memory, that he, even in the dark, he had this, at the, at the end of his life, he had this power and nobody knew him anymore. Mm -hmm. so that juxtaposition um, is, what stayed with, is, is what stayed with me. And, and, I, and you know, what you're saying is the fact that nobody um, knew him was partly deliberate. That in, that no, in fact, I was, I was that pretty just, old. Just, I was in my 40s. That you, that you had to be younger than me if you didn't, you didn't yeah. know it. Yeah, but, but, I mean, but I'm saying you're saying that his paranoia was in fact, they're still, they were still after him. Yes, they yeah. were. Yeah. I wonder if Paula has a list in her heart or mind of who our protest singers are today that might... Because I don't really like, like nowadays, like modern ones. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a couple of years ago we came across Marcarelli. I think yeah. he's, and his music actually right, reminded me very much of Phil Oaks because it was the same kind of, for me it was very similar, just a different war. Um, and that's the main one that I think of, but I don't know, it's, there's not, I don't hear as much of it because the way I come across my music is very odd. I either get it from my parents or my friends mm -hmm. or various websites on the internet. And so I haven't really come across much more than that. And I usually listen to the older songs that he plays me. So. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard. Has anyone? Oh, are there new singers coming up with that Billy kind Bragg. of critical content? Yeah. Pardon? It's Billy Bragg. Who's in the film. Yeah. 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 He's still not but, that young. And yeah. Young I mean, the only names I can think of people who are still writing are people who were writing. Uh, and, uh, I mean, kind of the opposite. Uh, 
spectrum is John Mayer's Waiting for the World to Change. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine in the 60s somebody saying, I'm waiting for the world to change? <laughs> That's a good point. Wow. Mm -hmm. but I, I think there's a whole lot of protest singers, but they don't have a national stage because that stage is so corporatized. Mm -hmm. Nobody sneaks in anymore. But it's also like, what do you define as like a protest singer? What do you have to be protesting? Because mm -hmm. I listen to a lot of music mm -hmm. which I wouldn't say it's protesting anything very political, but it does make its own statement in a way. So, it's like, what is a protest singer? Well, if, if Phil Oaks were here today, what do you think he would be protesting? What song would he write today, you think? Oh, I think he would be bubbling over with anger as we go by. I think one of the things that he might take on most painfully for us is again a kind of liberal betrayal of, 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 of passionate involvement, um, of, a, of a political, of a politics that is a politics of accommodation. Um, I think that whatever, you know, whatever, whatever else, I think, I, I think, love me, love me, I'm a liberal, um, would be maybe the song, it's, it's, it still in some ways resonates. Um, as well as the direct anti-war songs, which don't seem to go away. You know, we're the cops of the world still. I've come to terms with that. Do you think he um, stood out just strictly as a wordsmith, as a songwriter? It's, it always seemed to me that, you know, protest songs can so easily be just knock you over the head, boring. Some of his are. Yeah. I mean, let's not, let's, not, let's, not, let's not create a god. Some of his songs yeah. are awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but his good ones are great. Yeah, he was, yeah. he's a far better songwriter than he was a, than he was a, a singer, for sure. Uh, and, and that's another thing. I mean, for me at least, when I was... I didn't get a voice tuned to Bob Dylan until I heard his song sung by other people. And you know, he didn't hear a lot of Oak's songs being picked up and sung by other people who had, would have had better voices. Um, I mean, his voice was not great. It was, it was, it was suitable to a lot of the songs. Pardon? I, I actually think that, I think that part of what made him so extraordinary was that the voice had, at least the early voice, had a sweetness to it. Yeah. That, 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 that sort of brought out its own irony. You know, you had this kind of, you know, gentle, sweet voice that was saying, I ain't marching anymore, you know, and, and uh, that, to me that blend of, of his vocalization and the words was part of what makes him so compelling. Uh, I mean, yes, there are other voices that are perhaps more profound, but, but I think that his voice was a, a Marvelous marriage with his with his lyrics. At its best, yes. Yeah. And, and I, I agree with you. I think there's something about his wordsmithing. Uh, you know, if you just read the poetry, um, it's got a richness and clarity that I, I I was surprised again tonight. No, as a lyric. Yeah, no, as a lyric, as a lyricist, he's, he's and 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 he's incredible. Um, you know, and, and the songs that are bad are bad not because they're badly, because the lyrics are bad necessarily, but simply because the topicality just sort of, um, he gets caught up in his own shtick. Do you, do you think he suffered um, a little from the boy who cried wolf syndrome, that, that he um, had such a broad spectrum of things to complain about, that, you know, there wasn't a focus, and, and it maybe it was just of the times that that was the case, um, but I, I just wanted to know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we, I mean, I mean, wait, he wasn't alone in this. I mean, I mean, one, one, someone else that, that Paul has come to love is Tom Lehrer, mm -hmm. and his satirical songs range certainly as broadly, um, uh, and when you think about Tom Paxton's uh, songwriting, um, there was, I mean, and 
uh, more recently, Bright Morning Star. Um, I mean, all over the place um, in terms of content. I think, um, if anything, I think, and, and I say this as someone who, who worked in Mississippi, I think he was a little bit obsessed, maybe just it was the time, by Mississippi <laughs> as a symbol. Um, you know, kept in song after song, kept referring back to. No, I, I feel like there is something about being somewhere in there, though, about being picked up by other people and sung by other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, because one of the things about that day that we've sort of tend to forgotten that maybe we haven't even, is sort of the fact that we used to sit around and sing. Mm -hmm. uh, that we that these were songs that weren't that we weren't just listening to music. People were sitting around with guitars and without guitars and singing all the time. I think Anita Bryant recorded "Power and Glory." Did she? Yeah. Oh, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> 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 well, of course, Changes was, was recorded by a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, no, you know, a couple of songs. Well, Changes is totally unthreatening as a song. Yeah. 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 I mean, Changes is, is, is completely... Well, so, so is Power and Glory, unless you read between the lines, you know. It's, it's well, a... I think it's pretty strong. Well, yeah, but I mean, so, so is the Battle Hymn of the Republic, you know. It's, yeah. it, 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 as a patriotic anthem, it can be... It can be Pretty digestible, but of course it has that twist at the end. You know, it's all, we're only as tall as we it's, it's only as tall as we stand, but that's that's okay. I think he made everything so personal with I'm pissed at this and I'm pissed at that that other people didn't want to get involved in it. This was his deal, and I'm not going to sing about it because this is his fight. Oh, I wouldn't have thought that. As far as I thought, I mean, goes. I, mean I, th I thought he was very, very much giving a voice in many ways. Um, yeah, but he was so strong about his feelings that I think some people... Are you, might, talking, are you talking about in or outside the lyrics of the songs? Inside. Just, I'm saying this, and I think other people might have been uh, hesitant to pick up on it and sing it. He wanted everyone to join in with the fight, but... I think he came off as a leader. The songs are not all that singable <laughs> compared to other people who were writing at the time. Uh, Tom Paxton, Bob Dylan, um, Country Joe, who wrote an anthem. Uh, it just wasn't as singable as that. It's not blowing in the wind. No. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have that same kind of simplicity. I think of the best of them as singable. Again, I, I mean, he wrote a lot, and he wrote a lot of mediocre, and he wrote some bad, and he wrote some good. Anyway, what do you think about some singability? Eh, if you don't want to sound good, if you don't care about how you sound, any song is singable. <laughs> <laughs> no, but knowing that I was coming yeah. over here tonight, yeah. um, I tried to sing some songs. <laughs> and I had trouble remembering the words. And they weren't very singable. Maybe 40 years ago when I knew them better, but they just weren't very singable. I'm a guitar player and I spend about four hours today playing yeah. the hook songs. You mean, are you agreeing or disagreeing? You're saying, oh, I thought we saying? sang them a lot in the days yeah. that I thought of, and it's exactly what you're saying. People sitting around with a few guitars and singing songs, and there was a lot of that then. Well, he was, he was an artist, and he wasn't, I mean, he didn't, he wasn't going to be confined to, you know, a notion of a folk song that was campfire songs, and that's why he did things like Pleasures of the Harbor, which was, yeah. you know, it's an orchestral, and mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a very complicated work. I mean, just think about the song, the Crucifix, I don't know, how did he remember the lyrics to that, to, to do it spontaneously on a plane flight, you know, to, to, uh, to John Kennedy, I mean, that's, <laughs> That's an incredibly long, yeah, complicated very, song, very complicated. and usually, I mean, even songwriters have to, you know, practice, rehearse their stuff before they go on stage. So uh, his work was very complex. But you know, it was one thing that reminded me, and I, I really think there isn't a, you know, a single burning thing the way the Vietnam War was to ignite. Um, you know, that he, he talked about counter melody was sort of his his premise for. Pleasures of the Harbor, sort of um, 
I'm not sure exactly what that meant, but but that's what <clears throat> so much of the art of that era was was counter melody to to the militarism of the Vietnam War, and the um, and, and there was another person who I, I'd totally forgotten about uh, uh, who was mentioned in the credits, a guy named Ron Cobb. Does anybody remember Ron Cobb? He was a he was a cartoonist, a political cartoonist. He was amazing. You should look him up. I I, I totally had forgotten about him. He he did the most brilliant political cartoons. A lot of them I bet you could reprint today, and they'd still be just as relevant. Um, a lot of things on environmentalism, and uh, and uh, and they were amazingly well crafted, and they appeared in the underground newspapers back then. And uh, apparently he was a, a friend, or somehow he contributed to this. But um, I, I, there's got to be a book of his stuff somewhere. But there really isn't any good political, you know. I, I mean, most of the good political cartoonists now are kind of ambiguous. Um, there's you don't see a lot of um, of that same kind of. Do, do I hear you saying? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. What I hear a lot when I go and talk to um, younger audiences when they say, "Oh, it was so much." Clearer in those days, and so much wonderful. The morality, the moral issues were clear. You, you, you could pick up a, 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 a fight <coughs> and, and carry it on. Now we can't do that. Now things are unclear. Is that what I, is that what I hear you? I don't think things were particularly clear back then. But, 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 there, was, but, there, but there was one thing that was clear to most people. Well, no, yeah, well, it, it, when you're young, a lot of things seem a lot clearer. <laughs> yeah, and and, uh, and there, was a, there was a groundswell of the, of the whole concept of us for youth, you know, as a distinct force. And, um, and so we had our artists who represented us. Now, you know, you, you like the, probably the same music that your daughter likes, and she likes the same music that you like. That, you know, I... Well, it, but, I mean, you find <laughs> that was the commonality. There, that, that was the difference, was that it was a forging of a, of a kind of a, that unified front consciousness, and we found our artists, and they made these simple de declarative sentences, and now it's all very ambiguous. You know, the great artists now... I was thinking Green Day. You're thinking, like, who's a, you know, who's a, a protest singer? Oh, well, Green Day did American Idiot, you know. But what, what the heck's that about, you know? I mean, is it really clear what they're protesting? <laughs> Except for American idiocy? I just wanted to respond to you. Um, take a look at um, Mike Konopaki and Gary Huck, a couple of political cartoonists out of Madison, huh. and I think you'll eat those words. <laughs> <laughs> Who, what are the names again? Mike Konopaki and uh, Gary Huck. Yeah. Okay. H-U-C-K. Okay, well, you look at Ron Cobb and compare. This is a kind of cartoon. Oh. Oh, cartoon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> www.solidarity.com. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, the, the documentary had one impact on me in terms of the present, and that is that it still feels really dangerous to stay that um, urgent about the issues. Oh, yeah. And the to be in it around anything that has any smacking of we're in it for some kind of success is to is to really be in a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the story of the, the kind of youthful vigor of the early sixties and and what those assassinations meant, and, and truly, in some ways, what the end of the Vietnam War meant, which, which did, oddly, ironically, collapse uh, the energy. Um, well, and I just, I, I look at today and I think, you know, how long mm -hmm. must we keep on fighting, and what dangers will we encounter, and how many casualties, like Phil Oaks type casualties I'm talking about, uh, must we endure, and and for what? And at what point do you know? At what point do you say this is ridiculous? I don't. I can't keep doing this because I'm not seeing any outcomes. And at what point do you say I have to keep doing this because I don't see any outcomes? Mm -hmm. And I, it just it, it seemed very very present day. Mm -hmm. well, there, there are two things that are One of the things about about that year seventy five um, sociologically. I mean, I know an awful lot of people among whom myself, who got married right out of college, in my case in 1967, 
and our marriages all fell apart in 75. Mine too. Yep. And, and, and even the during support group for that is after. <laughs> Grateful, but, <laughs> but but no no. I mean I mean one of the things I realized is, as I don't know what the other experiences we sort of think about is that there was a sociological component to that, which was that during the years before that we were very much very. This was talked about in the movie. Focused outward, we were focused politically. We were focused on doing things. We were very, and all of a sudden, to use his own words, we didn't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore. And we were forced to look at our own lives in a different kind of way and reevaluate and reassess and say, I'll tell you what am I doing? That happened and then... in 1975. Uh, I was working in Manhattan uh, as a writer, staff writer. And um, Bob Dylan gave a concert in Madison Square Garden. And I found about it for the first time in the New York Times. And I said, that's it, I'm out of it. If I need the New York Times to tell me about a Dylan concert, I'm not on the loop. <laughs> but there's another element in what David is uh, expressing, too, I think, that's really where the film <coughs> touches me, that this, it's either a fear or, or a recognition that if I stay in this place of awareness and passion for right relationship between people and between people and the planet, then it could consume me, it could destroy me. And I have this reaction when Pete Seeger shows up at the yeah. end. I'm like, oh, thank God, that's right, Pete Seeger, he's, he is he's more. <laughs> yes, and what does he have? I mean, I don't know whether Pete Seeger Granola. lives with... <laughs> I don't know whether he struggles with depression or not, but I to see that, no, he stayed in, he's singing his joyful, funny, challenging songs, and he survived. And he's 90. Yeah, he's 90. It's a second life oh, shoe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, one of the interesting things is that, is that Paula and I sort of come to politics differently, too. Um, the, whole, the, gener the newer generation, I feel, is more already more, I hate to use the word sophisticated, but modulated than we were at that age. Um, and I don't think it has to do with the simplicity or complication of the issues. I have a feeling it has to do because there's one battle that we did win, and I think we can congratulate ourselves on, in that younger people, and you can contradict me and agree with me on this, um, take for granted that they can have sophisticated and thoughtful approaches to public affairs, where we, and Oaks gave voice to that, we're fighting for that attitude. We're fighting even for the right to be able to think about these issues in certain ways. Um, I can remember editorials in my high school newspaper that railed against high school students who were going around um, raising questions and protesting. And this was in the early 61 and 62. They had no right to. And I think part of the difference in Paul and your generation is that you're much more comfortable in the political world than we were in some ways. I mean, we do do a lot of stuff. There are a lot of kids in my school who are activists <laughs> in a way. Um, it's actually really interesting. A couple months ago when the Wisconsin um, bill was passed about the labor unions, um, this happened on the high schools in Wisconsin organized a walkout. On faith through Facebook, and it went viral across Facebook, and it eventually reached my school. And on that day, they did organize a walkout for two o'clock on, I believe it was Friday afternoon. And there were a lot, I think about a hundred or two hundred kids who did get up and walk out. And the teachers all said, you know, it was interesting because I come, my school is in Brookline, Massachusetts. We are many. You can fairly say that Brookline is sort of in a bubble, and that there's this like idealized idea of activism in a, get, in a sense, where it's like, oh, it's always good, and like everyone's for it or whatever, because that's sort of how Brookline works. It's a little weird. Um, and I just remember we were sitting in history because that was history went from 150 to 245 on Fridays, and um, my, the first thing my teacher said when we all sat down is, I know some of you are planning to walk out. 
but be aware that if you walk out, you... She said, how many of you are planning on walk out, first of all? And about <laughs> half, three quarters of the class raised their hands. And she goes, be aware that if you walk out, I will give you an AWOL, which will be recorded back to your parents and go on your transcript, and you will get a zero for your homework. And so one kid said, but that's not fair. <laughs> and she goes, well, what did you expect? You're walking out of my class, you know? And just, I almost think like, we take it too far in the opposite direction, this idea of like speaking out politically. Whereas in your generation, maybe it was so too taboo. We now knew we would seen, fail. We would knew we would be fa failed for walking out of the class. Now it is seen as so much of a right that it's a shock <laughs> when people say, face the consequences of your action. Which of course, like, what is the purpose of walking out if not to face to, to create see some consequences? Yeah. Yeah. Create tension. And, yeah. Yeah. and it was interesting how many people didn't like capture that. It, ultimately, only a third of the class walked out. If you, so eight kids. If you walk out, I'll give you an A for civic involvement. <laughs> 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 that seems to change. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because you know, it's a different time. I remember walking out of my high school um, right after Kent State, mm -hmm. and. That was because one of the students who graduated from my high school was killed at Kent State. That's why we walked out. Yeah. It was a, it was the, it was really a serious situation. Right. And in 1960, see, that's what we've lost. That sense of generational unity. I mean, in 1968 at the Democratic Convention, I was working on Capitol Hill. But a classmate of mine from Oberlin, who was a pacifist, made the cover of Newsweek with his face bloody and his head bloody and his church sh shirt torn at the Chicago Convention. And it was personal. Uh, everything was personal. Uh, when General Hershey wanted to reclassify every war protester 1A, a friend of mine got reclassified 1A when he was nowhere near a demonstration but on a on a way to a national debate tournament. That's 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 some pretty subversive right there, a national debate tournament. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that um, we we felt a connection with one another across boundaries and across borders. And I don't and I don't think that's there now. Well I would say there's still like that connection, but, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, but there was sort of like more of a focus in the 60s or that time period on like one issue, one big issue, which I guess would be sort of the war and Two. Uh, President Nixon. Um, Two, the war, and the, the war and the cities. Yeah, but now, I mean, it's just, I think there's just so much going on at once that people, like, we did a current events project in my history class. Once a week, we discussed some issue, some, write an article from usually something like the New York Times or some other newspaper, um, and we discuss a lot of different issues. Uh, we discuss what's going on in Libya, uh, Native American rights these days, uh, the gay rights movement, um, all sorts of just different aspects of what's going on in the country today. And what was interesting to see was that from week to week, different students spoke up. But rarely did you have everyone in the class actively participating on one issue. Mm -hmm. So it's like before, I'm sure if you started a conversation, a lot of people would get involved and be actively interested and invested in it, or at least that's the impression I get. Whereas now we sort of faction ourselves off into, oh, I'm focusing on this problem or whatever. I'm focusing on this. So whereas we're unified in the sense that we want to commit, we want to create change, we're disunified, yeah, divided, that's what yeah. I'm looking for. <laughs> divided by the just variety of things to focus well, on. There used to be a draft, and now unified the yeah. yeah, so that has a way. Yeah. But still, I think, I think it's a little bit of a telescoping and an oversimplification to say that we were unified as a generation. Yes. I think that's partly a little bit of a historical reduction. And partly maybe caused by by our memory of songs like those of, of you know, that, that sort of created the culture, yeah, created yeah. the voice of the culture. I mean, I remember um, tremendous divisions and tremendous political arguments. Um, 
and quite frankly, a girlfriend who broke off with me because of my political activity. I mean, would have nothing to do with it, with with me after that. Wouldn't speak to me. Um, but even within the civil rights movement, which you came to know yeah. very well, divisions about strategy and priority. Well, they're always yeah. I mean, were, I, oh, and, I mean, the divisions within the civil rights movement were nothing. They were they were all. Um, they were all about tactic. They were more about tactic and strategy. There were nothing to be the. I mean, there were fist fights between the Young People's Socialist League and the and the Young Socialists. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean that was where you got. I mean, you got some really destructive. If we think that you know that our political parties can be self-destructive, you should see what you know what the student left could could do to each other. Um, at a time now that we sort of look at and say, uh, well. From my point of view, everyone says, oh, yeah, you were active in the 60s. You, you must have been a hippie. We hated the hippies. People don't even know the difference yeah. between an activist yeah. and a hippie. We despise the hippies. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I mean, we said, certainly we were active. We were not going to drop out. We were not going to um, take that route toward responsibility. Um, I mean, the divisions were, they were talked about. They were tremendous. They were talked about, though. And I think, I think, it's an illusion which may be destructive to your generation to look back and it looks as though it was one big happy well, and you're also not absolutely that. right about that. And you're also right about the draft being yeah, the draft was a unifier. But there's yeah. another thing too, and that is young people were an issue. The generation gap was an issue. And when I got out of school in sixty nine, I found myself in the odd position of being one of the few people who could talk to both sides about the other side and not make them feel angry or guilty. And um, that was a very strange place to be. But young people were an issue, uh, especially in the old liberal community. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you, I'm listening to all this and I'm, and I'm you know, having you know, been part of it, uh, some things I realized was we were a very small minority in the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, to think that everybody was like this, I mean, yeah, there were right. damn few people who knew anything about folk music and or protest music. When I was there, there, there was a small minority. It was mostly the Beach Boys or something like that. It, it had nothing to do with this. And the whole movement itself that everybody, you know, seems to think we were all together was a very, very small, which, which Nixon kind of proved when he talked about the silent majority. I mean, there were, there were lots of kids in college that had nothing to do with this, didn't want anything to do with it, and they were the majority. They weren't yes. there. Yeah. We were the minority. But this is, this, the thing, this is the where history thing. has given us the distortion. Right. Because yeah, in, effect, in, thing, in effect, we did sing louder than the guns. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing is, is, is um, I, 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 I'm a little different than you. I was very attuned to Dylan. I, I liked him immediately. And I never liked Phillips' voice at all. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think he might be a monotone, seriously. Because he would sing, it seemed to me, when I was listening to it again, he, he puts lots of pressure on the higher notes, but they don't necessarily. I mean, he has some, he has some. I think it's not as musical as it could be. Anyway, and it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Bob Dylan calling someone else a monotone. <laughs> <laughs> Ambitious, uh, both of them wanting to get to the very top, and that was the thing that was on their minds. Uh, I know in Bob Dylan's case, uh, you know, I came to find out later that that was his sole ambition. I mean, he starts out. My friend Bill and I were talking about that tonight. We, he starts out a protest singer, and then he moves to much more lyrical things, and and then he takes everybody beyond. But but that's him. He he wants that for himself. I don't think he said, um, I'm bringing a whole generation with me. He was saying, I want to be on top. This and is I Bob Dylan. Okay. Well, I, I think if, 
I, I think that both Dylan and Oakes eyed each other as as rivals. Um, I do too. Um, I don't think I don't think Dylan ever really thought of himself as a protest singer. And one of the things I respect him for, I mean, he was very much more art for art's sake than, but it included the world. No, he could the put songs in broadside but, magazine yeah, for thirty five dollars. Yeah. But um, uh, Oakes identified himself far more politically, but I think they did have their eye on each other in very many ways, and um, there were stories in that last year um, about Oakes being very hurt by being slighted by Dylan. And I do remember that one of the big tensions before the, the Felt Forum Memorial Concert for Oakes was whether Dylan would show up or not. And I remember vividly that was sort of the scuttlebutt, the game of this conscious car. Will Dylan come or not? Will Dylan come? And Dylan did not come. And from my point of view, it was a very wise decision. And I thought it was a very sensitive decision. Because had Dylan come to that memorial concert, the concert would have been about Dylan's presence. And you know, I, and, and I think I think and I, and I have enough respect for Dylan to think that he would have recognized that. And you know, when, when, when at that concert, when my, I mean, when the line that I remember most from the Felt Forum concert, the line that, that set tears in my eyes at the moment, when you know, when it was said, was Jerry Rubin standing up and saying very quietly, "Well, Phil, you brought us together one more time." Mm -hmm. And I think that was the spirit that was meant and intended at that memorial concert. And I think had Dylan come, had Dylan inserted himself. It would have brought that rivalry thing up. It would have put that in, and would have distorted um, the significance of Oaks himself. So, I think there was a tension there. I mean, they have to be thought about together in some ways as, as two aspects of what was going on. Well, I don't think Dylan in the was, white music scene. I don't think uh, Dylan was that noble of a person. I think he was interested in getting to the top, and and he he saw what he needed to do to get there. And I'm just wondering if. Uh, if Phil Oaks, some of his depression comes from the fact that they both started out together and they and that he wanted to get to the top as well, which is pointed out several, four or five times in the film, and then he and then he didn't get there. And he was anonymous. Oh, oh he was no, he was definitely felt hurt and by I wonder him. if that, you know, brought on, you know, the depression and eventual suicide. Because I, I don't see I don't see either one of these men as um, I want to be the leader of, of the movement. Mm -hmm. I see them both as they, they're entertainers, they're songwriters, and they want to get ahead. And they're trying everything they can to do that. I mean, he says, he has a super ego and says, you know, I'm going to sell a million records. That's not a man who's saying, you know, well, what do I do with the movement? I'm a little I, yeah, cynical about yeah. this. I don't think those are necessarily completely in conflict, especially in the movement of the time, um, when one of the things that was going on among the politics, and again it's sort of a little bit obscured by what's happened since, is we were all still learning how to use the media, and the media was learning how to use um, us. these figures, us, us. Um, I mean, I remember, I remember, this, this is, I mean, we could have the same conversation in a way about Abby Hoffman. And about what his purposes and goals were, um, and I think I think there's a lot of I mean I, I, none of this is a clear cut as I think <laughs> um, a lot more confused a lot more sort of mixed up and confused in figuring it out. Um, but this dynamic yeah. makes me want to hear more from Phil Oakes about the experience of coming to know Victor Hara, because oh, for yeah, yeah. for the for what he witnessed in the South uh, in triumph and then in devastation, but then in Victor Hara's great triumph of the spirit, and everyone who sung in that stadium knowing what that meant for them. What did, what did that mean for, for someone like yeah. Phil Oaks to see really, you know, revolution, to see movement led by music? Now? But he also, I mean, if Phil Oaks, to his credit in my mind, was bringing music to movements. Um, he was making decisions that weren't commercial decisions to perform um, at benefits and protests and whatever. He was bringing people together. That he was, was, absolutely. And, I think that's 